Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our colleague who will provide closing keynote address. My name is Liladhar Pense, and the closing keynote will be provided by Lalita Natraj. And the title is, What Do We Do in the Shadows? Uncovering Absurd Bureaucracy in Libraries. And with that title, I want to give you some background information about uh, Lalita. Lalita is the social sciences oh, that's what she'd say. librarian okay. at California State University, San Marcos. She holds an MLIS from UCLA and a BA in English and women's studies from UC Berkeley. Lalita also spent several years as a public librarian championing the inclusion of diverse materials in children's and teen library collections and continues to write professionally for school library journal. Her research interests include feminist pedagogy, critical information literacy, South Asians in librarianship, and scholarly inquiry and the research cycle. Lalita has authored and co-authored several papers and presentations focused on the application of critical race theory and librarianship. Most recently, um, nice white meetings, unpacking absurd library bureaucracy through a critical race theory lens with fellow CS USM colleagues, Holly Hampton, Talita Matlin, and Ivan Melmans. And I would like you to welcome Lalita. Lalita, welcome to our conference. It's good to see you again after so many years. And please, uh, I'll be quiet now. It's your show. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen right now. Um, give me just one second here. Um, I'm really pleased to be with everyone today. Um, thank you so much to the Lauk B Conference Planning Committee for extending this invitation for me to speak with you all. I'm so sorry that we cannot be together in person, but in this moment, I definitely feel the nostalgia of rushing past Strawberry Creek and the Valley Life Sciences building towards the soaring Sather, Sather Tower, or as it's more colloquially known, um, the Campanile, just to make it in time to my shift as a student assistant at Doe Library. So to be presenting at this conference is truly an honor, and it feels like I'm coming full circle because it was here, um, or rather over there, at UC Berkeley as an undergraduate that I learned how to view the world more critically and to question the long-held social values and principles that governed how I interacted with the world, as well as my own interpretation of it. Now, it all sounds very cliche, but truly, it felt like I was waking up from a deep slumber. So this presentation is a bit rough around the edges um, just because I'm exploring some ideas, some new ideas with all of you. And um, I'm just looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. And I'm grateful for this opportunity for us to be um, together today in conversation. And as my friend and colleague, Veronica Ariano Douglas once noted, these talks can be an entree into relational discussions about critical librarianship, as well as um, a means to challenge the imposter syndrome that some of us so very often experience in these types of situations. Um, though I have been a librarian for, um, gosh, 15 years, um, the time just flew by. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm solidly mid to late career, but I'm newish to full-time academic librarianship on the tenure track. And so the liminal space that I currently find myself in um, affords me more latitude than I've ever had professionally to share and discuss views without fear of reprisal or negative judgment. So you can surely understand why I feel simultaneously exhilarated and also terrified to share some of these inchoate ideas with an audience filled with folks whose work so, so very much inspires my own. Um, so I want to um, share a land acknowledgement um, before we begin our conversation. I want to offer first offer gratitude to the indigenous people 
who for generations have stewarded the land I am on today. So I am presenting uh, from my home in Carlsbad, California, and I acknowledge that the land on which I share this presentation is the traditional unceded ancestral territory of the Luiseno and Kumeyaay peoples. I am a South Asian American immigrant settler and guest, and it's important for me to acknowledge the grievous colonization of this land and its original peoples, characterized by profound injustices whose impacts continue to reverberate throughout the region to this day. And I sit with this irrefutable and undeniable fact and vow to be accountable in tangible and visible ways to the needs of American Indian and Indigenous communities. And one way I commit to this action is by donating to the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center at CSU San Marcos, which supports American Indian students through culturally appropriate mentoring and leadership development, also funds tribally relevant and tribally involved college educations and engaged tribal community outreach. So, let me first start off by saying um, that I'm very serious about my scholarship, but I'm also an irreverent person. Um, and I think humor is really the balm that's kind of been getting us through these past um, two years. And so I decided to title my very serious talk, um, What We Do in the Shadows. And um, this is a television show. Um, it's an irreverent mockumentary that um, revolves around four vampire roommates and one human familiar, and they live in modern day Staten Island. So Nandor, Laszlo, and Nadja are several hundreds of years old, and they're your run of the mill traditional bloodsuckers. Um, whereas the other vampire, Colin, he's a contemporary energy vampire and a day walker, and he gains his power by basically boring those around him um, and draining them of their energy. And um, it's humans and vampires alike to the brinks of to the brink of collapse basically um they just pass out because he's so boring um and guillermo is nandor's hapless human familiar and he usually goes along with his master's ridiculous schemes in hopes of one day being turned into a vampire himself now you don't have to have even watched the show to appreciate the connection i'm drawing today between the vampires foolish antics resulting from their steadfast adherence to antiquated traditions and the convoluted and often irrational practices that abound in libraries. I mean, if we stop to really consider how many academic librarians function today within the constraints of a higher education bureaucracy, talking about vampires seems less and less nonsensical. But I also called my talk What We Do in the Shadows to illustrate what underlies our work. David Graeber um, once noted that while bureaucracy was intended to move us towards equity and efficiency, it actually does the opposite, and it allows power structures to flourish unchecked. Now, because such practices are foundational, historical, and so deeply ingrained, we generally only realize the macro effect once our morale is severely impacted and we experience burnout. And as I'll discuss later, lack of transparency and secrecy are hallmarks of bureaucracy, which makes the shadow imagery especially apt. So I just want to go over a little bit of bureaucracy 101 before we get into this talk. Um, so according to the German sociologist Max Weber, the six criteria of an ideal bureaucracy include authority over specific areas, hierarchies, written documentation, attaining technical competency through training, and spending longer time at work than required, um, and my all-time favorite, impersonal and uncritical adherence to rules and regulations. And these qualities belie efficiency because we find that we're usually accumulating more work and adding greater stress, which seems counterintuitive to what a bureaucracy was intended to do. But I want to go back to the image of all secret meetings taking place in the fancy room. 
Um, here we see the vampires, as well as the familiar Guillermo standing over them, um, gathered for a secret meeting in the fancy room. And this is the perfect visual uh, metaphor, I think, to describe the intersection of ritual and bureaucracy. So ritual, coupled with secrecy, facilitates a sense of belonging, particularly among those who hold the power within the organization. And ritual also enables the longevity of a bureaucracy. And Emile Durkheim once observed that when we socially engage with the same people over and over again, so think about like those long drawn out like meetings that we have, um, there is a tendency to focus on what a group is sharing in common with it with each other. Um, and over time, the ideas that are shared, they become foundational um, to institutional values and norms. And there is a constant pressure for all workers to conform to these ideas. And rituals, um, if you think about the meetings, which are the ritual, they serve as a metric of conformance. And Simone Abram notes that meetings are ritual performances where, quote, formal transparency is intertwined with relational and informational withholding, end quote. Information with, uh, withholding information is a common bureaucratic feature, as we all know, allowing those with administrative power um, to control people lower in the hierarchy. So yes, knowledge is power, and definitely not sharing it um, sort of like underscores that um, power. And from the context of academic libraries, when we convene working groups, it's in the spirit or it's supposed to be in the spirit of inclusivity and consensus building, which adds to that sense of belonging. But in actuality, they're just the venues for tracking compliance and performance targets. And it's in the metaphorical and sometimes literal fancy room where administration has already predetermined the outcome and they present it to working groups as a fate accompli. When, so when the outcome is different, from what the working group originally proposed or their deliverable, um, that can feel very demoralizing, right? Because you know we've put in all of this work and it ends up being for naught. And in the metaphorical fancy room, membership is limited to those who continue to replicate institutional norms. And of course, those who challenge those ideas, they have to stand outside of the room, so to speak. Okay, so um, this is a really hilarious image of Kristen Shaw um, as the floating woman, and I'm going to play a short video, um, a short clip, and um, so hopefully this will this will go through. Um, it's going to open uh, YouTube, and I hope everyone can see the video. Um, so the point of that clip was really to demonstrate um, kind of the ridiculousness of ritual. And you can see that there's simpler ways of doing things, but by following sort of like these, these kind of arcane um, ways of like doing stuff, ways that actually take longer, because obviously the 500 Ravens, that was a longer process than just calling. That's sort of symbolic sometimes of what we experience in bureaucracy. Um, and so, when the four of us were actually writing um, nice white meetings, um, that's Holly, Talitha, Yvonne, and myself, we kept circling back to Robert's rules of order. And um, that is a parliamentary procedural manu manual that was written in the late 1800s by Henry Martin Robert. And it's been revised several times since then, uh, but it governs how many institutions run their meetings. Uh, and these rules are super formal. And if you serve um, in any capacity, like in you know, governance, um, academic governance on your campus, you'll probably recognize a lot of these rules, um, such as you know, there's four types of motions, uh, politeness is the order of the day, etc. And these rules are so regimented that there's actually little room um, at times for creative discussion and, um, and discovery. And so with Robert's rules, they were written at a time when Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC, 
were completely dehumanized, violated, and relegated to the margins of society. And with its emphasis on maintaining order, determining fairness, and also um, the tone policing that goes on, Robert's Rules is sort of is one sort of bureaucratic ritual designed to maintain white hegemony. And we can map Robert's Rules to Tema Okun's characteristics of white supremacy culture. Um, that includes the sense of urgency. Um, so when we have these meetings, there's like the sense of like we have to um, we have to discuss these um, items in this particular sort of order, um, and that can curtail the implementation um, or raising of new ideas. Uh, we also deal with people's defensiveness sometimes in these meetings, and that requires a lot of emotional labor. And of course, in these meetings, we prioritize quantity over quality, and um, that is you know, valuing metrics over relationships and process making. So rather than being, you know, as relational as we can be in these meetings, there's always this urgency to, um, you know, demonstrate effectiveness of something, uh, showing, you know, particular statistics, etc. cetera. Um, and in that sense, uh, we also lack the imagination to see how information can be um, disseminated beyond the written word. So there's this real heavy emphasis on documentation, especially written documentation and keeping of the record. I want to talk also about the um, unbearable whiteness of library bureaucracy. And we know that there is little in American librarianship that evokes non-white culture. And in fact, the library has been long perceived as an aspirational, physical, and intellectual space steeped in Western aesthetics and sensibilities. And um, as we wrote in our article, our modern minds conjure the image of cloistered medieval European male monks hovering over um, illuminated manuscripts. That's like a very um, prolific image that we, that we experience especially around um, literacy. And Fobazi Attar um, takes this imagery further by stating that library workers labor beyond required hours. Um, and remember, that's one of the features of um, bureaucracy, uh, working beyond your required hours, because um, these workers see themselves through the lens of a martyr-like vocational awe, and they perceive their work as sacred and necessary and beyond critique. Um, as Attar wrote in um, their 2018 article on vocational awe. And having such a worldview makes it incredibly difficult to reproach practices that actively cause harm to BIPOC workers. And believe it or not, it is all by design because historically American libraries have maintained an outward appearance of inherent goodness. Um, they enact these policies and procedures that are designed to create an informed citizenry and spur lifelong learning. But in actuality, and you know, historically, if we look, um, and Todd Hanma has written extensively about this, um, these policies actually facilitated assimilation and acculturate, acculturation into a white culture as a means of um, civilizing. Um, and Gina Schleselman Tarango uh, has also covered um, this idea in, um, in her fantastic article, the, the Lady Bountiful article, where she talks about, um, you know, librarianship as a civilizing project um, for um, white women. Um, and it was, of course, a means of exercising control over BIPOC. Now I want to share this fun image. I'm sure everyone's seen this. I'm a very big fan of memes. Um, and this is the Persian Cat Room Guardian. Um, it's by artist Anya Bose or Boz. I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But um, anyway, this is a meme that we often use to convey um, confusion and frustration. And here I use it to illustrate how BIPOC feel when we're required to engage in what Graeber refers to as interpretive labor um, or the emotional gymnastics that we have to do to try and decode management's intentions and expectations of us. 
And the work becomes heavier when we consider how librarianship's professional standards are grounded in white culture, including the academic jargon that we adopt, as well as the way we're supposed to look. And we are always judged against white norms. And as Angela Galvan notes, performing whiteness always comes at a high personal cost, high em personal like emotional cost, but also like financial costs. Um, they discuss uh, this idea of performativeness, like when it comes to, for example, having to look a certain way at work, having to present yourself in a certain way during meetings. Um, you know, we could consider, for example, an interview to be one type of meeting, one type of bureaucratic process that we, um, that BIPOC have to engage in, and we have to um, have a certain, you know, visual uh, standard, right? And of course, as a survival tactic, we engage in what Katrina Davis Kendrick calls de-authentication. Um, and this is really the downplaying of all cultural, ethnic, and racial markers to embrace whiteness. We're basically hiding our authentic selves. And we do this to protect ourselves from the inevitable microaggressions that we face in the profession. Okay, so I'm gonna play this other clip here. Um, this is the energy vampire Colin Robinson. And I feel like this is this is a clip that so many of us could relate to. Um, and again, you do not have to have seen the show to appreciate the comedy. Colin, Laura would like a word with you in her office. Laura, I think what's happened is they finally figured out that I don't even know what the hell this company does. <clears throat> Just watch, I'm going to be as cool as a cucumber. <laughs> it turned out to be the exact opposite of what I was thinking. They actually decided to give me a damn promotion. Well, I'm the boss. <laughs> Arnie, stop talking to Joy. Okay, so, so many feelings watching, watching that clip of Colin, who basically has done nothing to earn his promotion. Now, I am not trying to make a connection, um, saying that, you know, all the, you know, men who are in our profession, especially white men, have done nothing to earn their promotions. Not at all. That That's not the point I'm making here. The point is, is that Colin doesn't really have to try as much because of his white male privilege. He just gets that promotion. And um, if we watch the this clip further, this episode further, he uses his position um, in management. He exploits it to drain the energy of his employees because that's what he does. That's how he survives. He has to drain the energy of people around him. And it kind of makes him power hungry. If you're going to watch an episode of the show, I highly recommend this one. It was, it's just, it's so hilarious, but it's also very, um, it feels very real. Uh, so here, Colin has ascended the corporate ladder, as I mentioned, with little to no effort. Okay, really zero. And um, it's really on the nose. And in librarianship, white men represent 20% of the profession. But they, but they occupy 40% of leadership roles in ARL libraries. And so the gender imbalance in the library profession, it amplifies the effect of absurd practices, um, like this one where Colin just gets a random promotion. And the advice from several female identifying librarians to simply, you know, say, you know, we have to lean in and, and we have to promote ourselves, um, that's really unhelpful. Um, uh, Fobazi Attar tells us. Um, in fact, BIPOC women just don't have that luxury because we're forced to manage the expectations of white colleagues around us who might see us as a threat to the status quo. So we essentially go along to get along. Um, and so now I want to shift to a conversation about what it's like for BIPOC to strive for the acknowledgement that, you know, here Colin just got so easily. Um, for us, for BIPOC, at times it can feel like um, a Sisyphean task. Um, you know, that dude in Greek mythology who is 
doomed to basically push this boulder up a hill only to have it roll down, you know, all, for all of eternity. Um, so that's kind of what it feels like. Whoops. Okay, so this is an image here of Antonio Banderas um, as a vampire in Interview with the Vampire. And then in the middle, we have Guillermo, the human familiar. And then on the far right, we have um, Tom Waits as Renfield um, from the 1992 film Dracula. And the reason why I put all these three pictures together is because in one episode, um, Guillermo says that he aspires to be like Antonio Banderas, like he wants to be this character, but instead he feels more like Renfield, who is subservient and just really doesn't have as much like any power. He's just doing the bidding of his master. And so earlier, I mentioned the macro effects of bureaucracy impacting morale and leading to burnout. And here I want to talk specifically about how BIPOC workers are, are particularly affected. Um, so I'm kind of using Guillermo as a conversation about Guillermo as an, as an entree into this idea. And we often think of libraries as progressive, socially, social justice oriented places, right? But they're actually complicit in perpetuating subtle, nebulous, and unnamed manners that harm the well being, self esteem, and success of those who do not share the norms of white culture. Um, and this is what D Diane Gusa wrote in uh, 2010 when she described um, white institutional presence. And of course, here in what we do in the shadows, Guillermo is constantly trying to interpret the confusing and oftentimes insensitive things the vampires force him to do. And as the show goes on, the viewers see his fatigue. And um, so the audience knows that he's never going to be turned because that's what he wants. He wants Nondor to eventually turn him into a vampire. Um, but that's not going to happen because the vampires will never see Guillermo as an equal. And they purposely marginalize him because they never want him to attain alpha like status. And, you know, this this can sort of be seen as a metaphor for BIPOC trying to ascend in an institution amid this bureaucracy, um, trying to interpret all of these codes and um, norms around them with the hope of one day being in a leadership um, role, having parity with their white colleagues. Um, and sometimes it, you know, oftentimes it feels like a futile task. Um, Guillermo is clearly smarter and more interesting than his master, but he's forced to hide his ingenuity and wit, and he's also gaslighted and ridiculed at the same time. The inane vampires, they can't even get his name right, and they often call him Gizmo, um, and this is, of course, a microaggression that has a lot of us nodding in commiseration, um, you know, with not pronouncing someone's name correctly, you know, not getting their um, pronouns correct, you know, those are all microaggressions. And of course, I want to state that the irony of Guillermo um, being played by a queer identified Latinx actor, um, that shouldn't be lost on us. Um, he basically symbolizes BIPOC workers navigating white hegemonic bureaucracy, but he just can't get it right because we're not meant to. So I want to share a story. This is a very old picture of me. This, this, uh, some of you might recognize this image. It was, it appeared in. Um, this is what a librarian looks like, uh, like a book that was published uh, a few years ago, and um, featuring a lot of librarians um, and talking about like their roles. And this was taken when I still worked in public libraries. And as I mentioned before, that's where I've spent most of my professional career, um, in the thick of bureaucracy. Uh, most of the institutions that I worked for, um, they were assailed with budget problems. Um, and prior to coming to CSUSM, I was at a city library whose services were outsourced to a private corporation as a cost saving measure. And by the time many of us found out what was happening, um, by the time we found out about the outsourcing proposal, it was already a foregone conclusion, um, which of course sounds familiar from what I just discussed. Uh, the community forum meetings where the public pleaded with the council to halt the outsourcing. Um, these just sort of felt performative 
it wasn't performative on the part of the public who really felt like they were, um, you know, they were genuine in their appeals and they felt like, oh, maybe we can make a difference. But it felt performative in the sense that the council had provided the space for people to talk, but had already pre-made the decision. Um, and as a public librarian, I often felt that I was adopting a scarcity mentality of always doing more with less. And this not only included my work, but the emotions around it. And in terms of connecting with this, this outsourcing idea, um, you know, a lot of us felt like, hey, we're so valuable, we do so much, you know, we, we don't necessarily cost the city that much money. Um, you know, we tried to present ourselves as really indispensable. And I, and we did a lot of important work, but the city didn't really necessarily see us in that context. Um, and so, you know, I, at, at, around the time that the situation was going on, I suppressed a lot of my misgivings, but one day I made the mistake of um, expressing my displeasure um, because I'm only human. And when I did that, I was asked, why are you so angry uh, by a white female colleague who, um, you know, I, I have to share this um, because it's just too, too funny, um, not in a funny ha ha way, but just like, of course, these things happen. Um, this white colleague ended up being promoted to a media role at City Hall. Um, so yes, I am spilling some of that tea. Um, norms such as smiling at everyone and modulating my tone uh, were left unstated and I only learned the correct way to be after I'd made the errors and felt shamed by my superiors. And so these experiences were isolating and they did a number on my professional confidence, which is something I continue to work through. And what is, why am I weaving all of this together? Um, because I feel like we expend, BIPOC expend so much emotional labor trying to be of value to an organization, trying to fit into its um, often, uh, you know, uninterpretable like norms. Um, and it feels very futile and um, pointless, particularly when you are um, criticized and you're isolated. And while I'm talking about public libraries, everything that I've said can easily be translated to an academic environment. And, you know, just a cursory, you know, look at your social media, you know, Twitter, uh, you'll see that like some of these themes kind of pop up in libraries everywhere. So they're kind of endemic in that bureaucratic structure. Um, so like, what do we do? Like there, this stuff is happening. Like, how do we, how do we get out of it? Um, we, we've also been kind of, uh, we've been playing a role in perpetuating a lot of uh, what's going on, just because again, as I mentioned, it's just so deep and ingrained in the organization that to try and break out um, is, we have to be deeply intentional about it. Um, and so here I say, let there be light, just making a play on, you know, the shadows element, you know, uh let there be light and the light can be critical race theory um, because it provides us with the framework to critique bureaucracy and it's really salient in this context because um, it originated in um, legal scholarship and bureaucracy of course is intertwined with legal authority and it's rules based and these rules in a bureaucracy become less and less clear as people rise in the hierarchy, ensuring that only certain groups um, read white ascend. So CRT helps us to um, recognize that irrational and opaque bureaucracies exist to uplift whiteness and it challenges the notion that the law is neutral and, co and colorblind. Apologies for that. Um, ableist, you know, terminology. Um, but we're always told that if we just work as hard as we can, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, that we're going to be rewarded. Everyone is told that. Um, but the thing is, is that we are not all on an equal, you know, playing field. Um, and also this kind of thinking, it ignores historical inequities that have impacted 
um, and continue to impact communities of color. And impersonal bureaucratic policies allow libraries to adopt neutral stances in the name of equity and also avoid implementing anti-racist practices. Um, but CRT can show us that oppression is intersectional, historical, and above all, structural. And treating everyone alike according to white cultural standards only serves to sustain um, whiteness and also erase at the same time uh, BIPOC epistemology. So our ways of knowing, uh, they're just not really seen, they're not visible. Um, in the academy uh, that permeates in um, our, not only our policies, but also in the way that we deliver services to um, services and programs to our students and faculty, um, everyone who walks in the door. So to draw from Lung and Lopez McKnight, um, now we have a framework to contextualize our discontent. That's critical race theory. Um, our discontent that is with irrational bureaucracy. And now that we have this, we can work towards um, creating a more empowering future for ourselves. And this isn't just abstraction. There are actually concrete strategies to go about this work. Um, and I wanna share, give you a moment to read this tweet here. So I don't know if anyone follows the LIS grievances account on Twitter. Um, it is definitely an exercise in schadenfreude. Um, I don't know, I follow it. Sometimes I see some interesting things, but um, this is basically an account that allows people, presumably library workers, um, to anonymously vent about their work. But sometimes people will share pers uh, positive uplifting insights too. So this person writes, whisper networks are a coping strategy and not a solution. If you're proposing a policy to address discrimination and you just want people to confide in and warn each other but never address the conflict itself, what does that do? What are you really trying to accomplish? And the reason why I bring this up is that I see whisper networks as actually a concrete strategy, um, a way of moving towards a more um, liberatory future. Um, it's actually affirmation and not confirmation, not, it's affirmation and not coping. Um, they are, whisper networks are what Baharak Yousafi refers to as a library tactic of resistance. They're part of a tactics of resistance. Um, and this is a concept that she adopted from Easterling's expanded activist repertoire. And um, my colleague and friend, Mimisha Bhatt, um, notes that whisper networks affirm a person's experience, um, which is so vital for BIPOC workers who may feel isolated in their roles and question whether the problem is with them um, rather than the organization. Um, so we have whisper networks, but we also have the creation of uh, affinity groups um, like within our campus campuses or even outside of campuses, people that we can talk to, people who um, uplift us in all that we do. Um, I know I can share personally, I have an affinity group on my campus where I work with um, five other uh, librarians of color. Um, we are all female, cisgendered, and uh, we basically have leaned on each other for um, personal support. But also, like, there's been a lot of collegial support. A lot of us have been working with each other as um, research partners to get through the bureaucratic, and yes, it is bureaucratic, tenure track process. You have to, um, you know, check all these boxes and do all of this work um, to attain tenure. And of course, tenure is, um, that can be a very mystifying process to walk through because again, grounded in white norms, but when you have a group to kind of help you through that process um, and kind of give you that emotional support, uh, that can really um, be a game changer, I would say. Um, so I'm spilling the chai here, so to speak. Um, I'm saying whisper networks, they challenge the secrecy 
and lack of transparency that is inherent in a bureaucracy. And Yousefi writes that, quote, gossip is a significant tool of information sharing with and among marginalized individuals and groups, and it's a way to subvert norms, procedures, and assumptions. It is one active means to dismantle the benign and benevolent facades of libraries by revealing toxic practices that do real harm to BIPOC. And this isn't coping, it's resistance. Um, and also, of course, forming those affinity groups among ourselves, like I mentioned, um, that's a way of preserving our cultural capital. Um, whether we do it in conversation among ourselves, whether it comes out in our teaching. I, I happen to be a teaching librarian. So, you know, I, I talk a lot about cultural capital um, as I'm working with students, um, you know, talking about uh, the scholarly, um, uh, the scholarly conversation, which, of course, you know, there are definitely some elements of bureaucracy in, you know, the way we produce scholarship in the Western world. Um, I talk a lot about uh, how we assert our own epistemologies. And this, of course, is a form of uh, counter storytelling, which is a feature of critical race theory. So I've used this image of Tilda Swinton here. Um, this is, uh, I can't remember the name of the movie. I think the only only lovers alive, I think. But actually, she plays a vampire in it. Um, Tilda is wonderful. And she also made a guest appearance on what we do in the shadows as the head of the vampire council. Um, and so here I want to talk about another tactic of resistance, exaggerated compliance. And um, this is where, you know, for those middle managers, who are expected to filter information from an administration to their employees, there's an added pressure of trying to ascertain like what is or isn't deemed confidential. And a lot of times we don't really know why non-confidential information is hidden or not ready for prime time. And need to know information sharing relies on this idea that most people just don't care about the granular details. Um, and Yousefi calls this, a patronizing and false assumption. Um, she also notes that exaggerated compliance is an accountability tool and it undo and it undoes a lot of the secrecy by promoting openness and transparency, um, or as Tilda would say, thrilling chaos. Um, if we are expected to go along with whatever administration wants, we are going to share all of the information. Uh, middle managers, of course, can play a role in subverting bureaucracy by taking a critical look at how work gets accomplished. Um, like, for example, do we really have to have a meeting to talk about this thing? Um, you know, trying to save time, trying to look at how work, how the work of um, the unit gets accomplished, um, as well as sharing decision making power among employees. Middle managers have to trust that their employees can do the work. Um, so, for example, giving them control of budget decisions and being okay with the outcome, even if it's not something that they would have pushed for, um, so that it's not a pretend leadership. And not to, I, I don't want to be vague, I want to give a concrete example here. And I will say that right now in my own unit, um, in the teaching and learning unit, we do have a department head, but our department head currently, um, they, they have some... Uh, like some some time that has been um, sort of reallocated they're they're serving um, as our university senate chair um, and so what they've done is um, they've they've gotten some release time uh, for their role as department head and so a lot of us in the department have been stepping up to uh, become the department heads we're calling ourselves um, like the rolling heads because uh, every three months, we're going to rotate leadership and we're doing um, the, these roles in uh, like a co co shared sort of way. So I am currently the acting department head for the teaching and learning unit with my colleague Judy. And we've been in this role since August and we're going to step off at the end of this month. And then two more colleagues are going to step on. And that's how we're going to run this entire um, academic year. And so far, it's been an incredible um, 
eye-opening process to be an acting department head because it's not just um it's not just for show it's it's there's actually um de decisions that we're allowed to make um and so yeah it's it's been it's been a really incredible um i guess like experience like to to just share this this responsibility um there's a lot of trust in here. Uh, it's just been great. So I'm gonna end my talk here, but I just wanna share, there's my work cited. Um, and of course my slides will be uh, made public. Um, I'm gonna also play some music while you all think of questions that you wanna ask me. This is my um, cat here. This is Nadia. She is our new Sphinx cat. Thank you so much, Lalita. Uh, you made me homesick by speaking about spilling the chai. And uh, I have been tasked to uh, convey some questions, so you might want to um, answer uh, them uh, in the order and read them. Um, first question is, what would you be your advice for BIPOC librarians trying to change that? Should we aspire to become admin or just focus on good work where we are now? It's so hard to navigate how to climb the ladder without confirming the white structures. And I'm reading them as they come in, you know, I, per, as they call it verbatim. So if you would like me to repeat it, I will do it. Um, I'm trying to find this question here because that is a really long question. Right. So, so, oh yes, here it is. Okay. Yes, I, I see this question. Um, so I guess my advice, I mean, I can only give you my sort of personal um, kind of uh, experience, which is um, in terms of changing from within the inside, I definitely feel it's important to find your people, um, find kind of get some critical mass among um, like your colleagues, like have have a place that you can go to where you feel safe talking about these things. As I mentioned, like having an affinity group is a space where you can be, you can have a lot of your ideas validated, a lot of your feelings validated and, and simply by, um, by sort of trying to reduce feelings of isolation that can really help to build confidence among um, BIPOC library workers and we've been seeing some success with this in our organization um, when I started working there I can't recall I know a couple of my colleagues are in this presentation too so maybe they could correct me in the chat but we didn't have as many BIPOC librarians kind of sort of banding together to talk about the things we were going through and it's only been in like recent years that as more and more um bipoc librarians have been hired as we've increased the numbers at our institution we started formalizing these structures we have um we actually have a bipoc uh group in our library that meets to um, actually discuss policy implementation. We're working on um, trying to implement um, anti-racist practices, make it really a critical part of our strategic planning. Um, I know that's a really long answer, but I'm saying like start, start small, small things make a difference as Adrienne Marie Brown would say. Um, when you start small, you just kind of can expand out. And I would say first start by finding getting your support that's the most important thing your your mental well-being like that's like primary what you have to take care of first um because trying to conform to those structures those white structures it's so debilitating thank you so much the the next question is also kind of long but it is as follows bipoc library workers continue to be asked with fixing these problems inherent in these bureaucratic systems through diversity committees and similar assembled groups. How do academic libraries move away from this model and fully embrace the collective responsibility to
to fix the organization. What would that look like and how are BIPOC voices still included in that process? That is, that's a great question. That's something that we're continuing to grapple with at CSUSM. And I can tell you some of the things we're doing. We, we actually have, um, a lot of our white colleagues are in like an accountability group, like, like a white faculty accountability group. So they kind of meet separately and they have like their readings and, and have like discussions about like, what can we do to, um, to mitigate the burden on our colleagues of color. Um, and so they're, they're, they've been meeting like, um, I think they started meeting earlier this year, they've had a number of meetings. And so they're working on trying to concretize their plans. Um, we've had um, in the library, um, like anti racist reading uh, groups, we, we were all reading um, like several texts and um, having conversations around that. And we're also, we also changed our leadership model, which I think is incredible. So now we have something called the library leadership team. And it's different from what we had before where it was only cabinet heads. Um, the library leadership team um, is basically like, it, it has a very diverse makeup of folks. So not only the um, cabinet heads, um, when I say cabinet heads, I, th those are basically like the library unit heads, like head of technical services, teaching and learning, et cetera. But now, in addition to those folks, we have staff representation, we have BIPOC faculty representation, and these are the people who are um, working very close with the dean and associate dean to um, revise and implement policy. And um, so in this respect, the work isn't all on BIPOC, but their voices are still included in the process. Got it. Thank you so much. And, and you know, we are all conforming to some structures and there are rules we have to follow. Um, you know, there's a question about, uh, and I'll read it. Uh, I have been told, although I have not personally confirmed, that we need to follow Robert's rules in governance meetings for regulatory purposes. Is there an alternative framework that we might be able to use instead? Uh, so it's about the frameworks and yeah, so if you can please advise us. I'm like so good at bringing up problems, but like solutions, like sometimes that's hard, right? I, I think that um, well, from what I've been reading, uh, there, there's a lot of move towards like sort of consensus-based um, meeting meetings. Um, there's also like, I don't know if there's a way to kind of rework norms. Um, if, if we have to follow Robert's rules, because I understand that it's very difficult to implement that change, you know, university wide, like so many, like, you know, academic senates, they follow Robert's rules. But I think that we could also start by having a frank conversation within those um, meeting venues and talking about like, you know, is this really the best that we can do? Like, I don't know how the critiques have, I've, I've never served in academic senate, so I don't know how critiques have necessarily been raised um, in those groups. Uh, but I would say like working towards like some sort of consensus-based um, model, but then also finding a way to I don't know, like promote like a much more um, like promote something where we are hearing everyone's ideas, like ideas are flowing freely among folks so that creativity is not constrained. But then at the same time, um, you know, we have to try and be mindful of, you know, people's time. OK, thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I feel so bad. I feel like this uh, naughty empty. In I don't India. think I really Thank had you. like an answer beyond consensus. So, so coming back to the roots, uh, you know, you, you mentioned about rotational leadership, right? Like sometimes, uh, like you mentioned that three months, you will be the uh, lead in your department or the, or the acting chair. So the question, next question is uh, very interesting. It talks about how did you get institutional buy-in for this model of rotating leader, leadership. And what tips do you have 
for folks trying to replicate in their respective organizations? I um the it was kind of incredible. We okay, so so when our department head was elected, um, so this is Yvonne. Yvonne's our department head. Um, and she was one of the co-authors of the article with us. Um, when she was elected academic senate chair, you know, she was very real about, you know, how what her capacity was. You know, this was something important that she wanted to do because, of course, being academic senate, like that's a lot of power. And the way she saw it was like, wow, you know, like I could actually be a voice, you know, for the library as well in this capacity. Um, but of course, you know, she's a voice for everyone, but like this, this was like such an incredible opportunity that our department um, and also the library, we wanted to find a way to support her. And I would say like this idea originated within our department. We were like, okay, like what is, what can we help you with? How can we, um, you know, support you in this, you know, endeavor? Like you want to be the Senate chair, but obviously, you know, you have all these other things on your plate. And that's kind of the department dynamics like a lot of stuff I feel like we get we test out within our own department. Um, and we work in a very interesting way we're all very relational with each other. Um, and what that means is like we try to be mindful of one another's capacity and that's a really important thing to keep in mind, particularly when you're trying to. Um, when you're trying to sort of subvert norms. And you're trying to change the way we work because we work within bureaucratic constraints and what our department is doing is we're saying you know what not so much like you know some examples were um gosh we've we've changed a lot of stuff in our department and honestly the way we do it is we come up with what we feel are very reasoned um arguments and justifications for why we do things th this way and i hate to frame it in like this capitalist context because it really sucks, but we're a very productive department. We we basically get our shit done. Like we get a lot of stuff done. We get the work done. And so what we told our dean, and our dean is, you know, I think they're a very supportive person. We said, look, it's important that Yvonne serves as academic senate chair, um, rather than appointing one person to be the head for the entire year. Um, and that would probably be like a tenured person, like because there's no one who could do it. Everyone was just full of like we we're just you know at capacity we said let us rotate leadership because this spreads the labor among all of us so none of us are working more hours than we have to a bureaucratic feature we want to preserve our time so by rotating leadership we do that these people take it for three months then those people take it for three months and on top of that we are sharing decision making across the board everyone has a chance to lead the department and understand what that's like so um i don't know our, i i i don't know what the magic is our dean was like yeah i guess okay if you think it'll work and so far it seems to be it seems to be working fine knock on wood i have one more month to okay. mess things up okay so it past two months so now i think it's the last question almost so you know, it's about the experiences we have um, in these type of models. And, and, and the question states as follows. I had a bad experience at a library with rotating leadership responsibilities for individual contributor librarians with no additional compensation. It was built um, or pitched as a growth opportunity and resulted in tensions between units and librarians feeling taken advantage of. How are rotating leaders compensated, or what are some ways that they will not be taken advantage of? Um, I see that this question was from Anne, and first of all, I have to say hell no to that. Like that, that is terrible. Like you should not have had to do that work with no compensation. Um, that that is that is not okay. Um, we no, we are getting compensated. I should have mentioned that from the start. Um, so the way it works in on our campus, I guess, if you're like a department head. Um, oh, okay, I see Anne. Okay, sorry. Um, so I, I, I'm sure it's a question all of us have had. So um, we so the department head gets a stipend, right? 
Um, and what we opted to do, um, what Yvonne did was like, there's no way I'm going to ask people to do this work and not be compensated. So we worked with the dean so that everyone who is in the department head role, they get um, an additional stipend added to their salary. So every month I'm getting additional money on top of my regular pay to do this department head work. And then, of course, when I am not doing it, then, you know, the stipend, you know, it'll go to the you know next group of people. So, yes, in short, we are getting paid. Okay, thank you so much. So compensation is the key. And um, I wanted to take a quick second to thank you uh, for this um, thought provoking speech, at least for me and for our audience members, I believe. And that, and that concludes uh, this part of uh, conference. Stay tuned for the, the, the next uh, wrap up. Uh, and thank you, Lalita, again for coming through and helping out. With, really, I, I'm inspired myself. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was really great.